Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining us for the third session of the NJCM, NJCAA Summer Seminar. Um, this session will be covering NJCA Championships. Um, my name is Mackenzie Harrison. I am the Assistant Director of Marketing, Marketing and Communications at the NJCA National Office. Um, in this session, we will cover um, various aspects of the NJCA Championships Department, including championship bids, um, how they're awarded, and hosting a championship. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll make sure to get those answered um, by the end of the session. Um, just as a reminder, the recording of this session and all other seminar sessions um, will be available to view on NJCA Connect by the end of the day. Um, if you were unable to join us for the first two summer seminar sessions for NJCA 101 and NJCAA Media, um, those will be available to view this afternoon. Um, so at this time, I will turn over um, to Rod Lovett, NJCA Director of Championships, and Darren Drake, um, Sport Event and Championships Associate for the presentation. Thank you very much, Mackenzie, and welcome to everybody. Um, I know that uh, this has been a, is a busy and long couple, three days for those of you who are sitting in on lots of the different um, talks. And so uh, hopefully we can educate you a little bit on the way we do things. Championships have evolved and changed a little bit over the last few years. Um, just to give you some very brief background, those of you who don't know me, um, I was actually the chair of championship events when I was a region director uh, for almost eight to 10 years, I think. Um, and uh, Jerry Smith is our chair of the championship events committee. And, uh, and I've now been in this role, which will be two years um, coming up this uh, end of this month. Um, and so things have evolved. And so this just gives us a chance to talk a little bit about uh, the process and how we get things done uh, as far as selecting our sites. Uh, we do have now 51 national championships this year since we've added division two cross country, uh, both men's and women's, and Division II soccer, both men's and women's, so it's up from 47, and then we'll be at 52 championships the following year. Um, I think it's the next year after that when we add beach volleyball. Uh, as you know, after yesterday's announcements, probably one of the biggest challenges we're going to have, assuming that we pull off the six cross country meets um, this fall, the half marathon and women's tennis, we'll still have um, we'll have eight championships in the fall and 43 in the spring this year. So that's going to be quite a um, taxing uh, entity for our staff, for the marketing staff, for all of us, and for all of you as athletic directors and coaches and region directors. So hopefully we can get through all of that as we move forward. You can see there, those are the sports that we offer for national championships. And as you can imagine, several of these are both men's and women's in several divisions. But if you go through, we have obviously three national championships in baseball, six in men's and women's basketball, two in bowling, six in cross country now, one in football, I think four in golf, two and a half marathon, two in lacrosse, three in softball, six in soccer, two in swimming and diving, four in tennis, uh, six in track and field, three in volleyball, and one in wrestling. And that's what gets us to our 51. So those are all of our um, national championships that we currently are offering. So in this uh, oversight, we'll talk a little bit about the bid process, uh, how you go about bidding, site selections, a listing of our future championships that'll be up for bid, and then a little Q&A, and I'm happy to answer any questions that if I can, as we talk about this year uh, and all the changes that'll be going forward with championships. I don't have tons of answers specifically about sports, but I can tell you a little bit about the process that we're gonna be going through um, that's already started with our championships host for the spring. All right, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have changed things up a little bit over the last two or three years. Um, a lot of this was, in all honesty, a lot of this happened because hosting a championship has changed so much because now there's parts of this about having Wi-Fi, being able to stream. Is the lighting good enough for an event to be streamed or be on television? Um, video boards, uh, different kinds of turf, 
just lots of different variables that have changed over the years. And I'll, and I'll talk about this later, but just the whole bid process has changed significantly over time. When I first started, I would say, and I'm just throwing these numbers on the exact stats here, but probably 80 to 90% of our national championships when I first came on board as a region director were bid on by host colleges. And now um, I would say it's probably the opposite of that. Most of ours are bid on by sport commissions and CVBs, uh, sometimes in conjunction with colleges, some not. Um, so if you look there, September 14th for this year, all bids to host NJCA championships and football bowl games. Uh, the proposals have to be received by the NJC at that time. Those are available on our website. Um, there's only just a handful. One of the things we decided to do uh, back this spring is to cut down the number of championships that were going to be available for bid this year and move most of them to next year. Uh, we felt this was important to do because, A, the trade shows that um, I normally or Darren normally goes to are not all going to happen. Um, B, we were very concerned about the ability to make quality site visits um, with travel restrictions being in place. And so we just decided to move some things. But we'll still have a handful that'll be due in September. Um, between September 1, 14 and October 1, the national office meets to narrow down prospective bids and notify potential sites to arrange site visits. So our staff goes through, looks at the bids. Sometimes in all honesty, we only have a couple bids for a particular sport. This year, uh, interestingly, one of our highest bid events was cross country. Um, it was, I think, I think we had 14 bids come in for cross country, and that's a very high number for us in total bids. I think from some CVBs and sports commission standpoints, it was an exciting thing because it's a one day event. And so you get the benefit of quite a few hotel, hotel rooms, quite a few participants, but from a volunteer standpoint, you're not there for the entire week like you are for basketball, baseball, soccer, some of our events that are, are longer. Um, between October 1 and February 15th, a member of either the Championship Events Committee, the Sports Committee Chair, the NJCA National Office, or a designated person to represent the NJCA will conduct a site visit survey on the top bids as needed by, and those are the expense of the championship bidder. And so we do explain that to them. So if we've got somebody bidding on D2 volleyball, we call them up and tell them we're interested in their site. We want to make a site visit. We work with them on securing that. We tell them items that we would like to see, uh, questions we might have, people they might want to uh, put us in touch with, uh, and explain to them that they are, it's at their expense. So if I have to fly to Kansas to go look at a site, they pay for my visit, uh, they pay for my hotel, um, they pay for any arrangements. So that is part of that situation. Um, the reason why we have so many of those different people, it just kind of depends on the event. Um, when people bid who have previously hosted, unless there have been significant changes to their facility or to their bid, we don't usually do that. Also, we try to take the pressure off, not just having the local folks um, do the visit. As you can imagine, um, I'll, I'll use this example back when I was in Illinois uh, and I was the sports chairperson, it was very difficult because we had two bids from our region for a particular sport. And it's, you know, it's difficult to put that region director or committee um, chair in a position where they're making that final, final call. So that's a little bit about between October 1 and February 15th, we try to make all the visits. Um, within two weeks of the visit, we'd like to have a written report, including the site survey review, photos, recommendations are due back to the national office. Um, this report is then eventually shared with the NJCA Championship Events Committee, um, our staff, and then oftentimes the sports committee chair prior to that, our winter meeting. Um, we hopefully, you know, sometimes if it's just an absolute no-go, and usually that doesn't happen. To be very honest with you, I have made probably 50 site visits in my lifetime, and probably 90% of those go very, very well. There's different levels of them, and some of them you can see that they're really committed and they really do a great job. I, I don't know if Dale Voss is on here, but when we made the Division II women's basketball trip up to um, – Michigan several, a couple of years ago, I mean, they did it right. I mean, and they went out and they had staff members all in the same tops. And uh, we had a big luncheon that had all the important folks in the city uh, that were there. And some places just really put it all together and, and really shown interest. Other places, in all honesty, you might meet with just one or two people. And that's okay too. Sometimes that's all it takes. But um, in those reports, you know, we get a, a, give a list of things to go over. People give us a report back and let us know what their recommendations for that particular facility might be. 
By March 1st, the national office in conjunction with the championship event committee will hold a conference call to review and approve championships receiving only one bid and to further discuss all the multiple sports bids prior to the annual meeting in April. So if we've got a sport, let's just say um, lacrosse and we only have one bid for men's lacrosse, that bid would still be reviewed. And if everybody is okay with what that particular site has to offer, we can go ahead and get that approved at the March meeting. It doesn't become official until the April meeting, but at least we don't have to keep that on the docket. There's no reason to keep it active. It also helps us to be able to tell sites because sometimes sites have bid on other events with other organizations um, and we may be on a different time page or you know if they know they're not getting it then they of course can release that time period and say okay we bid on lacrosse but the njca is no longer considering our bid now we might be able to put in a bid for a high school event or another collegiate event or or something else um, so through that period of time um, this is one, probably one area that has gotten a little bit more is it really is a strong recommendation from our office by that March 1st meeting where we will say, okay, we've reviewed these, here's what we're recommending that we accept. And then the Championship Events Committee in conjunction with the Director of Championships will meet at the NJC annual meeting to review the final recommendation of the National Office and make the final recommendations uh, on championships and bowl games. Final approval then goes from championship to the NJCA Board of Regents who has the final say, all right? In that time period between March 1 and the April meeting, any questions that came up at that meeting in February or Mar early March, um, any further information that we needed, any clarification. Sometimes we've gone back into somebody if the bids are different because all of our bids have different monetary amounts. Uh, on occasion, we will get places that will bid more or we'll get in a case where a person will come in and say, okay, well, we're not gonna give you $5,000, but here's what we're going to do as a gift in kind, and we're going to provide this, and we have to decide if that's something we, we want somebody to be able to do or not. Um, and so there's lots of, like I said, there's lots of pieces of this. We talk about the banquets, we talk about the facilities, uh, we talk about the, you know, the, the travel, all of that that goes with that, and then at the April meeting, final recommendations, and that's when the Board of Regents actually gives their approval to those. Once they give that approval, we then send out letters to all of the um, winning uh, bids. We also send letters to all the sites that weren't cho chosen, explaining to them in part why they, you know, why they didn't get chosen and what we'd like for them to do if they're interested in the future. So that's a little bit about the bid process. As you can see, it's an all year long type of thing since it goes from really September all the way to April, um, you know, each, each uh, school year. See if we can hopefully move on to the next page here. I don't have control of it, so. There we go. Site selections. And I, I went over a little of this just a little briefly, but just so you'll know, because some of the things that we look at as we're going through the different site selections. Um, first of all, obviously, facilities. We usually have specifications written out in the bid packet that go through all the things that we need, how many soccer fields we need, how many tennis courts we need, um, seating capacity for events. So we go through that, and so we go through facilities. It needs to meet and often exceed the requirements listed in the bid packet, and we include things like surface. Is it grass? Is it turf? Um, you know, do they have a uh, tarp if it's uh, for baseball or softball? Um, you know, what's going to happen? Because, again, like you do soccer for like D1 and D2 soccer. We're playing four games a day for three consecutive days on that soccer. So, you know, not every soccer facility has the surface that can handle 12 soccer games in a short period of time. As I mentioned, lighting, especially for our outdoor events, um, things like soccer, softball, baseball, we play games in the evening. And are there any, uh, you know, do we have any problem with that? With football, we've actually had to have lights brought in at Pittsburgh State because the lighting ca capabilities at Pittsburgh State um, have not met the needs for CBS. When we originally had Pittsburgh State bid, CBS was not part of the original uh, process. But moving forward, if CBS or any other entity is still going to be broadcasting that national championship game, 
one of the things we have to ask is, is the lighting going to be television quality or not? Because if not, it does add a significant expense potentially to that event. What kind of scoreboard do they have? Do they have a video board? Obviously video boards aren't um, required, but it is a nice extra, especially if we're trying to get fan involvement, extra, extra statistical information. Um, you know, I know when we went, started going to Enid, Oklahoma for Division II baseball, their video board was a big, big plus. That was for every hitter when they come up to bat, there's a picture of them up there. Um, and, you know, for our, our average NJCA athlete, that's not something they get to experience a lot during their career. And so when they're sitting there at the World Series and boom, they look up out there on the scoreboard and there's their picture and their name and everything, uh, I think it's kind of a cool thing for them. And so the video board type thing is usually not required, but it is a nice extra. Um, the quality of their public address system, are they going to be able to um, have a PA system out there? Sometimes we realize that they are, um, you know, temporary and they're just brought out for that event. Other times, you know, they're in, in other things. And that kind of goes same thing with press box. When, you know, if you don't have a press box where um, the announcer and score people can, people can be held, do they have the ability to put up a tent or something temporary to allow for that to happen? Um, big changes have happened, ability to stream. Not every place has the ability to stream, and that's becoming more and more important as the majority of our, our championships are now, um, are, have now been in the streaming area, and we're trying to do some things. Obviously, I think you guys know with softball, that's been one of our big issues over the years is that we've only been able to stream one softball game at a time. But now that we've changed up the format for Division One and Two softball starting this coming spring, that we'll be streaming um, all the games from those sites, hopefully, and that will be a big, big uh, plus. So we've got to have that Wi-Fi connectivity. And that's not just obviously for the people running the games, but people that are there from a media standpoint, from sports chairs, all that kind of stuff. It's nice to have the connectivity to Wi-Fi where you're not having to, to um, pay anything or, or that kind of stuff. Practice facilities are very important um, as far as things go because, you know, you use soccer, for example, in order for us to stay on a tight schedule, um, you know, there's a soccer game going on. There's got to be an area close in proximity where teams can warm up and get ready. It doesn't necessarily have to be two full soccer fields. Um, you know, I think back to, to Tyler this fall uh, when we had um, Division I uh, men's soccer out there. You know, we're playing on one field, and right behind us is another field, turf field. So those teams are able to stretch, get loose, what have you, and that way we're able to keep on schedule. And we only need, you know, maybe 20 minutes on the game field getting people ready. Uh, Baseball and softball, the availability of batting cages um, where teams can hit, uh, ability for teams to practice because once we get the tournament going, um, there's no ability to practice on the game field once baseball and softball have started their tournament. Same thing with soccer. We're just going, you know, nonstop. And so we've got to have alternative practice facilities. So those are just some of the things that go into, you know, into facilities. Um, but it's a lot more than just, oh, you know, we've got a field, what have you. And I know we've heard over and over again as we are, are – coaches, our athletes, our athletic directors, they want a championship field, okay? Um, again, that's one of the things that we're moving forward with in a couple of our sports to kind of have that championship field in soccer, that championship field in softball. So it's not just the big complex that's got four or eight um, fields going at the same type type thing, and you, it has more of a summer uh, tournament feel to it than a championship. We really do are stressing that at least on the final day of the event that they can be on kind of a special facility or field in those sports. Support, uh, as I mentioned earlier, less and less schools are bidding and now more being done by sports commissions and CVBs. This presents challenges since many of those are not in the business of running events. In the, in the old days when, you know, I use even somebody currently at Rock Valley uh, bids on division three basketball, you know, they know that they're providing the, the PA guy, the stats people, the person to run the scoreboard, um, ball shaggers, everything that goes to with running event. But when you go to a sports commission or CVBs, they are in the business of bidding on events, not running them. And so that does cause some supports or some issues. So we've got to know that there's a support group there. It might be a local club. It might be a local college. I do get this question a lot. People ask me, do does a person who bids on an event have to have a bid that goes in with the another with the junior college as a host? And that is not the case. We have several places that it is bid separately and there is no two-year college and, you know, directly associated with the bid. It's helpful, certainly, to assist people that are new, getting them to understand, you know, where some things are, but I, uh, you know, and help out with 
maybe getting officials and some things like that, but that's a whole other, you know, a whole other part of it. It's important to evaluate to have their ability to have volunteers. As you guys know, some of these events are held on weekdays. You know, we're playing soccer at 10, 1, 4, 7, oftentimes in pool play. As you guys know, the basketball tournaments are all day long. It might, our first game might be at 9 in the morning. It may run till 9 or 10 at night. Baseball is really tough because, I mean, you get out there at 9 in the morning, 10 in the morning for four games. And if you get any kind of weather delay or an extra inning game or even a game that goes 13 to 12, I mean, I cannot tell you. I was the D2 baseball chair for many years, and I can't tell you how many nights we didn't leave the baseball field until – 1, 1 1.30, 2 a.m. because of delays and stuff. Um, and so being able to have volunteers, being able to have quality table workers, to have, uh, be able to access officials, okay? Because it's not good enough to just say, oh, well, we run a softball field. We have tournaments here all the time and they go out and get a bunch of youth softball um, people. We always do want them to work with either the local NJCA or even NCA or NAIA assigner uh, or scheduler to help secure those officials because we want to make sure that we have um, the best possible officials if they're using local folks. Some of our sports, uh, Grand Junction and Hutch for basketball, get more of a national crew. And that's been an ongoing debate for us many, many years. Unfortunately, we don't have always have the money in each sport to bring people from all over the country. Um, there are even some people that would argue with us that when you bring in, you know, if you have a soccer game and you've got one official from Texas, one from Illinois, one from Maryland, and one from Florida working the game, the game doesn't get officiated quite as well because it's different styles. Um, so sometimes I think the localized part of officiating, officiating if they're good officials is, is sometimes better. But anyway, the ability to get some officials and then some community support with regards to attendance and media coverage. Those are really both important. Um, I'll use one of our, uh, I'm actually gonna use two of our current hosts, Danville uh, has been our longtime host for D2 basketball and they get outstanding media coverage. Uh, their local newspaper, uh, and then another newspaper that's within about 30 miles cover the event head to toe. Their games are on local radio. Um, they use a lot of the local um, DJs and, and sports folks to be a part of it. It's great stuff. We, in, again, Division II baseball in Enid, Oklahoma, uh, we used to be at a different site in Tennessee. They did a great job hosting the event, but to be honest with you, there was zero community sport. You'd show up at a game and there might have been three, four, 500 people there tops. Now, you know, you've got two and 3,000. You look at a place like Hutch, you look at a place like Grand Junction and community support is what really has made those events. Uh, Juco World Series is a huge community event in Grand Junction, Colorado. The, the Division I basketball tournament is a big event in Hutchison, Kansas, and it's growing in some of these other places as well. So uh, community support with regards to attendance and media coverage, very important to us. Location and weather. Um, proximity to participating membership is important in the final decision. It's not always the end decision uh, or the final decision, but uh, it is important part of it. I, I'll get people all the time that will call me and say, hey, I've got this beautiful lacrosse facility in Alabama. I've got a lacrosse facility in Wyoming. The reality is they may have one of the best lacrosse facilities in the country, but all of our lacrosse teams are located in the Northeast, and that would not be a wise decision for us to move the entire lacrosse tournament all the way across the country. We've made some changes over the years. D3 baseball would be one of those that took location into consideration. Tyler, Texas did an outstanding job hosting D3 baseball for many years, but we would get complaints that, you know, six of the eight teams were having to become a significant you know, distance. And so the last few years we've been in Tennessee and that has helped with cutting down the travel and making it uh, a little bit easier for some of the fans and those folks to get to see the games. Weather during the event has got to be considered. Um, you know, is it going to be too hot, going to be too cold? What's the local precipitation that goes on during that time of year? Are we going to get lots of rain? Is there still a chance for snow? What have you? I can tell you right now from a champion standpoint, we've had a lot of discussions about D3 soccer. Um, we've got some great hosts up in the Northeast, and probably five of the eight, maybe even six of the eight teams come from the Northeast. However, over the last several years we have not had very good weather in November and we've played in very cold temperatures, we've played in snow, we've played in ice. Um, my first championship I went to as the director of championships was in Rockford, Illinois and day one we played in 40, 50 degree weather. It was gorgeous. Um, I got a phone call at about four in the morning and asked me to look out my window and there was about three, four inches of snow on the ground with ice before. 
We were very fortunate in Rockford to have an indoor um, soccer facility located right next door. We probably would not have been able to play that day in Rockford because of the wind chill. It was going to be like nine, 10 degrees wind chill that night, and it would have been unbearable. And people said, well, it's all, the kids are only out there for two hours. Uh, in this particular case, I wasn't as concerned about the teams as I was workers, ball shaggers, our cameramen who would have been out there for basically four full matches in that kind of weather. So weather is an important part, you know, and we're, we're reevaluating all the time is, you know, sh is there a better place to maybe have D3 soccer? Nothing wrong with the facilities, nothing wrong with the host, but is the weather factor big enough for us to want to consider to move it? Um, the guarantee. We've got guarantees that are, to be honest with you, as cheap as 250 to $500. Uh, I think we've got some bids in there that are $25,000 bids. And we've also got a couple of our championships that have long contracts that give us significantly more than that. So you have to at least meet the requirement for the bid. Larger bids will be given extra consideration, but they should meet the above as well. I can't emphasize enough that this championship is about the student athletes and for the student athletes. If we've got a, just a premier facility, premier location, premier host, and they put in the required bid, let's say of 10,000, um, and somebody else comes in and they don't have a very good facility, it's not as good a location, whatever, but they put in 20,000, I don't want that committee or our group to ever feel like, oh, we've got to take um, you know, the biggest bid. Uh, as far as monetarily. On the other hand, let's be real, um, you know, our championships don't provide, that's the only place you get money from them now is from the, from the, all the two of the bids, or all the two of the tournaments is from the bids. And, you know, we do have expenses and it is part of our, our association's income. So the guarantee is, is an important part of it. And a lot of times if you can secure um, grants from outside organizations and things, those are often times how they use that as not coming directly from a school or a CVB, it's grants that they've been able to get by hosting. Then I guess the final thing that goes into site selection is banquet and athlete amenities. Um, the ability to provide a banquet or similar, um, as well as any gifts or extra events to increase the athlete experience. I was very fortunate when I was the athletic director of Parkland and as a region director that I attended a lot of national championships for both the D1 and T2 level. And I've seen some amazing banquets. I've seen some banquets that were just okay. Um, some of our sports provide money through their sports co sports associations, their coaches associations, for gifts uh, that they can give out at the um, at the events. Um, but all those things are a plus. I know I went to. I, I think back to some of the banquets when we were out in Arizona for Division II softball, probably 15, 20 years ago. They took us on like a hay rack ride and um, went out to like a, a western shootout and things like that, and ate outside, and it was just. One of those things that was kind of different. The people always remember it. Um, sometimes banquets look good on paper, um, but then actually the execution of them doesn't work so well. I'll again pick on Arizona for this one. Uh, and I think it was D2 volleyball that this one happened. On paper, they decided to have a banquet at um, the Arizona Diamondbacks baseball stadium. And it sounded like a great idea. Unfortunately, the seating areas weren't uh, large enough and so all the team not all the teams many of the teams were in different rooms and the guest speaker was in a different room and so it was just it was very awkward I felt to you know have that um, people ask me all the time about banquets this is more of a lecture than anything else folks but um, please be very careful when you're when you're getting your hosts for your banquets and who you get make sure they're educated on what your audience is make sure they're educated on how much time uh, if a speaker speaks longer than 20 minutes to be very honest with you everybody starts to zone out and it, it's, it loses its effectiveness. Um, those of you that know me very well know that I've told several stories from banquets that good things gone bad. And so you just gotta be very careful with, with that selection. But banquets and athletic, athlete amenities also go into this. Is it a unique location? Is it someplace that people are gonna enjoy? enjoy? Um, oftentimes, is there something else for them to do, especially if there's gonna be a, a day off during the competition or, or what have you. So. Those are just some of the things that go into site selections. All right. This is kind of a, a one pager that we pass out to all of our um, championship uh, hosts and people, just so you know, you know, we, like I said, Darren and I go to several different things. If you see there in the top head, the ones that are up for bid right now will be the football national championship for 21 and 22. 
the football bowl games in 20, 2021, 2022. If you already are hosting a bowl game and you're not changing anything about your bowl game, all we ask for is just um, – just the basics on that document, letting us know that yes, you are interested in still hosting. If you're a new host or you're changing the dynamics of your bowl bid, we make that uh, expand a little bit. Division three women's basketball for 2022, um, that's open because Rochester, who was originally uh, awarded that bid, is not able to host in 2022. And then beach volleyball will take place in 23-24. That'll be our first two years of uh, hosting a national championship in beach volleyball. We want to get those bid out um, during this year. And so those will be the ones that are going to be due in September. If we have to play around with those a little bit, that is one of the things that the committee does have the ability and the national champion or the national staff has to do. If our bids don't meet our expectations or we don't have enough bids, we feel like we can go out and contact folks and try to stir up some more additional interest. If you'll see there at the bottom of the page, those list all the championships that are going to be up for bid next fall. And so those will be due in September 15th of 2021. You've got four years of Division Three cross country, uh, half marathon, men's soccer, women's soccer, volleyball, indoor track and field, men's golf, men's lacrosse, outdoor track and field. So we've got a lot. Several of them are for four years. One of the reasons why we've done to those four years is so um, it matches up better with our um, divisional cycle, since that's now four years. It also is easier if we decide to split a national championship, um, we can do so a little easier. If it's a four year thing, we can give something to, two, to, to one place for two years uh, and another for two years. While we're on that topic, that's been kind of an area with a lot of discussion as of late, when we do split a bid. Some folks believe very strongly that the best way to split a bid is to give it two years to one host and then the other person gets it for the next two years. Um, the reasons behind that is that, um, you know, the first year you host something, you kind of learn the things that you did well and need to work on. And if you've got it right back again the next year, it's a easier to make those changes if you're, you're doing it again. If there's a year gap or longer, um, a lot of those hosts have felt like that's not ideal for them. Um, the reverse of that, one of the reasons why I probably have been an a proponent of the other method is I like the idea that when a person goes to a national championship, if they're fortunate enough to go both years, they may go to two different sites. So, you know, if, you know, baseball, uh, baseball not so much because we've really not been able to split those, but just say so softball or somewhere, if we went one year then to another, that to me is kind of an attractive thing, but that's not always the way we end up going. Golf has been more on a two or three year um, rotation as has cross country. Um, again, that's very important, I think, in golf and cross country because they're pl played on completely different uh, types of courses, oftentimes different types of grass, um, different uh, elevations and altitudes. You know, we were in New Mexico for cross country, and this coming year we're in Iowa, then we're in Virginia. You know, golf bounces from one place to another, um, oftentimes, sometimes in Kansas, sometimes it's in Texas, sometimes it's in Florida. Uh, Indiana, wherever it may be, so we bounce around. We've had an Arizona, um, and there's pros and cons to, to doing it that way as well, but just so you know, we do have those discussions of what's the best um, for the athletes, what's the best for the programs, and what's the best for the colleges that are involved, and that all, all of that is a part of it, and it's certainly going to be something we're going to have to keep a close eye on, I think, in the next two or three years, because we realize how tight people's budgets are going to be, uh, even tighter than they have been before, and so a lot of our selections are going to have to keep that in mind uh, as we move forward with some of our sites. But that one page document is available. If any of you ever need to have that sent, we can have that sent to you um, from our office. I think it's also listed on the championship page so that when people who are interested in bidding can see what bids happen to be up at this particular time. Darren, I think there's one other slide in there potentially. Let me see here. Maybe there's not. Nope, not on this one. Um, let me talk a little bit. I mentioned early, uh, or earlier about some of this, the events that we go to. There are basically five, I don't want to call them trade shows per se, but that's kind of what they are. There's about five shows that are take place across the country where you go in and basically rights holders who have championships uh, that need to bid out go and try to um, kind of show people what we have to offer, and that's what we use this white sheet for and other things. And we are meeting up with site holders. 
people who want to host championships. And as I said, sometimes it's schools, most of the times it's sports commissions and CVBs. Uh, some of these events are huge, I mean, a thousand people there. And you, it's basically speed dating for championships. Uh, we sit at a table and people come to us and they've got usually anywhere between six and 15 minutes to, for us to tell them about us. And they tell um, their story and what their facility has. Usually before we even go there, if there's 500 sites that are there, we go through and say, okay, we click through and say, here are sites that we would be interested in potentially going to as far as locales. Uh, and do they meet some of the requirements? You know, I will, won't lie, I come in sometimes and somebody will come in and go, oh, I got the best volleyball facility for your national championship. We've got 24 courts and all this stuff and blah, 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 blah. Well, that's a great facility for a lot of youth uh, volleyball tournaments or club volleyball tournaments. It's not the kind of facility, in all honesty, that we're looking for for a volleyball national championship. We're really looking for a place that has two courts that can be turned into one when it comes championship time that has more of a, you know, a bowl type seating uh, situation where people can see both events uh, and watch those. So, you know, that it's kind of a, it's kind of a mix and match. And sometimes you meet with somebody and you realize after you've met with them that nope, won't work. Other times you meet with them and you're like, hey, this could be a really good place. Um, this year, there are five events that we normally go to. One of them is called Connect Sports. It is actually still on schedule for, but well, I shouldn't say it's on schedule. It's actually been moved. It was supposed to be in New Orleans in August, and it has been moved to a two-day affair in um, Orlando. And that's September 9th and 10th right now. Uh, I am scheduled to go to that if things clear up a little bit in Florida. Um, there's a conference called Sports, the Relationship Conference. Last year, Darren and I went to that in Panama City, Florida. It's one of my favorites. It's a little bit smaller one. This year, it's September 28th to October 1st in Colorado Springs. And again, because these are in different parts of the country, we often are exposed to different groups of people. Sometimes it's the same people. Sometimes it's just sitting there building relationships and talking to people what's going on. Other times it's reinforcing. Other times it's following up on a previous meeting. There's one called Teams. That's currently still on schedule October 19th to 22nd in Houston. That one I think is kind of shaky right now because of the uh, COVID being pretty high in the tech in the Houston area. And I know that when they're looking at some alternatives, the U S sports Congress has theirs event December 7th through 9th. And that's currently in uh, Las Vegas. I did get a note today. They've actually moved it away from the strip and out to a resort in, um, I think it's called Hendersonville. I could be wrong on that. Just outside of Vegas, that might be a little more conducive to being able to actually run the event. And then a group's called sports ETA um, was supposed to be in Kansas city. Uh, it was supposed to be, um, I think, in April. Then they rescheduled again for August. And finally, unfortunately, they have just had to cancel it. And it'll be back in uh, play next April in Birmingham, Alabama. So those are the five events that Darren and I uh, have the opportunities to go to. Those have just been outstanding. We've built up some amazing relationships with sports commissions and CVBs. As, as, some, as some sports called me this fall and said they weren't going to be able to host the championship they were awarded, that's the people we were able to turn to. We were able to go back and look at folders, go look at contacts and look at people that, hey, we had met with before who maybe had or hadn't put in a bid. Um, I mean, I can tell you that like Richmond, Virginia stepped up immediately. Some folks here in Charlotte stepped up and were saying, hey, we know you're looking for some championships. Could you, you know, um, you know, here's what we've got. Here's what, you know, the possibilities are. Um, and so that's something that we could probably look at. It's not on our slides and I, and I don't wanna, I'll take just a few minutes to do this. Um, to kind of give you an update on where we are with championships. I know many of you were on the phone calls over the last week and we, we've emphasized over and over and over again that the dates that we put in as the championships for this coming 2021 year are tentative. Um, the dates for cross country, half marathon, those are pretty set for, for November and the locations and everything, we should be good to go and uh, we'll have to keep looking at that. Division three women's tennis is still set for October 30th to November 1st in Peachtree City, Georgia. Peachtree is good to go. Um, what we've got to look at is um, a little public service announcement here in case you haven't been on those calls. All the athletic directors are supposed to turn in to us by July 27th, each school's intentions for the 2021 year. Even if you've already let us know you were dropping something, even if you haven't changed anything, that form needs to come back to us because we have to evaluate with regards to our championships. And so I use, I'll use um, 
you know, D3 women's tennis, we only have about 15 teams that have women's tennis. If five, six, seven of those say we're, they're not, can't participate this fall, we'll have to reevaluate and say, hey, are we really going to run a national championship with only eight teams being eligible to participate? Uh, we may say yes. I'm not going to say what direction we'll go with that yet. We also may say that's unfortunate. We're going to have to see if we can't run D3 women's, um, you know, back in the spring. Um, we also are going to be looking at those declarations very carefully because um, if there's a region that has several teams that won't participate still in a particular sport, uh, we've got to look at that to see how does that impact our national championships. Does it mean the same district breakdown as we had before? Um, we're going to try to keep our national championship with the same number of teams in the same format, but if the numbers don't indicate that we can do that, and let's just say I'm throwing out a number here. Let's just say there were 90 D3 volleyball teams and right now it's a 12 team tournament if we only have 35 d3 volleyball teams that make it it's pretty unlikely we're going to have a 12 team national volleyball championship if only 35 teams are participating so that'll be something that we have to look at as we move forward what we are in the process of doing right now um, is contacting all of our hosts even hosts who had called us this fall and said hey we can't host um, this fall, but now if their sport has been moved to the spring, so I'll use soccer, for example, uh, both of our D3 soccers had told us they could not host, but we are certainly going to turn back to both of them now and say, now that the championship is scheduled for the last week of May, first week of June time period, does that work better for you? Um, I will tell you the only sport that we are locked in as on of this afternoon, we've gotten commitments from all three of our volleyballs and um, that kind of thing. And so we've been able to get the three volleyballs locked in at those courses and, and kind of go from there. Um, and we'll be doing that with all of our sites. We've been contacted, we've been contacting volleyball, basketball and soccer more in person today and trying to get those tied down. Um, we didn't move any of the spring championships. We've already moved wrestling and swimming, so we don't really have to, to do much with those. So it's the, the big three in all, all honesty are, are soccer, volleyball and basketball and trying to get those done. See one of the questions on here, Rod, um, can you share any issues relating to COVID for spring hosts in terms of banquets and our hotel accommodations? Number of people in a room, understand this is a fluid. Um, we did send out a note to all the fall championships before we ended up moving everything to the spring saying that all banquets were canceled. We just did not feel that the traditional banquet of putting, you know, let's just say we're talking about the 12 team volleyball tournament, if everybody travels with 20 people in their travel party and with other folks there, you're talking three to 400 people at a banquet. And all of us have been to those banquets, you're oftentimes sitting at round tables with 18 people at a table, you're six feet apart, barely between tables. It's a buffet style banquet oftentimes. Um, that's probably not gonna work in the era of COVID right now, um, that banquet type thing and those close proximities. We did tell people that they could get creative um, that we would still reconsider. And I will tell you that one of the people that came to us had gotten creative was D2 Volleyball. Uh, D2 Volleyball is a unique situation in that they're gonna be in Iowa and all 16 teams are gonna be staying at the same hotel. They have enough floors, they have enough hotel rooms to do that. It's a beautiful property. It's actually attached to the arena we're playing in. So those people are gonna have it great. They're gonna be able to almost self quarantine because they're gonna be able to eat, play, stay all in the basic same facility. They called about two weeks ago and I see D's thing on here, which is kind of what I'm leading to. They um, said to me, hey, Rod, we've got 16 banquet rooms. How about if we have 16 teams go to all different banquet rooms, we're gonna serve them a plated meal um, in the banquet room, but then we're gonna run the awards banquet virtually. Um, and so we went through that and that was one that we approved. I see we've got another question. Could we do a virtual awards banquet where teams can log in from their hotel rooms, restaurants? Absolutely. Okay. Just present that to us. Let us know and we'll work with you. I mean, I think a banquet is a very impart, important part of a championship event from the standpoint it makes it's kind of that special kickoff to let everybody know this just isn't a, another weekend tournament. On the other hand, we've got to be able to do it where it's safe. All right. Um, hotel accommodations. One of the things that we have told all of our hotels is to expect an increase in the number of hotel rooms that uh, schools might request. 
Uh, I won't lie, as an AD formerly, I was pretty stingy with money when it came to national championships, and we oftentimes put four people in a room. All right, and so if there were 16 people on the women's basketball team, men's basketball team, and they went to nationals, they got four hotel rooms. And then we got one room for the head coach, one room for the two assistant coaches, one room for the bus driver, one room for the AD, one room for the trainer. That's nine rooms. Well, I doubt that many of you are probably going to be in situations where you're going to be able to let kids share beds in hotel rooms. And so the 16 people that I just described, instead of four rooms of four, probably now goes up to eight rooms of two. All right. Um, that's probably just from a safety standpoint. That's going to be your choice. We're not going to mandate that. Um, and I guess to kind of follow up on that, we had been working with all of our hosts. So much of what had to occur is going to be based on the state and the local requirements that you have. Um, you know, right now, somebody said, is the NJCA banned fans at national championships? The answer to that question is no. If a site and a state and a locale feels like they can run a national championship and, um, you know, have seating, that's possible. I, I, D1 Volleyball sent me a note this weekend stating that they um, are probably going to do a sign seating at Volleyball Nationals. That's not perfect because, you know, you're coming in and you're only there for two hours and, you know, people want to kind of move around. They may not know what court they're going to be on. On the other hand, with some assigned seatings, it's much easier to them to put space between rows, space between sections, things like that where people are actually going to sit. So there's some creativity there. Um, even with our cross country, and we deem cross country to be a low impact sport with regards to the potential. Uh, you know, we'll work with our hosts. Do they need to put spaces at the boxes so not all the boxes are being used at the start line? Or do we send them out in waves? So if there's 120 cross country runners, do we take the 40 people that turned in the best times and they go off in the first group and then the next 40 go off, you know, a short time later so they're not all together and then the third group goes off. Uh, a lot of times those people, you know, the, the scoring systems that we have now, the timing systems, excuse me, allow for us to, to do some things like that. So uh, a lot of the final decisions will be uh, us working with the particular, the particular sites, but um, we do, don't want to just lock everybody into the same thing because especially, you know, right now we're talking, what, it's July 14th. You know, you're talking August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. We're talking almost nine to ten months before some of our championships and we all know how much this has changed from March to July. Hopefully we'll have some big upswings in positivity between now and, and our spring championships and maybe some things that we think today aren't possible, uh, you know, will be possible when we move to that. So that was kind of a long-winded answer, which is my typical thing, but um, we'll go from there. Um, for, clarity, for clarity with the NGSA, look at moving the cross championship to the spring. At this time, no. Um, Peter, the problem with cross country, in all honesty, is it is very, very difficult to move cross country when those athletes, in the most cases, are also tied in at their colleges to indoor track and outdoor track. And in speaking with the coaches association presidents and the chairs, uh, we were all in agreement that to try to run indoor track, cross country, and outdoor track all in the same semester would not be ideal. Um, I don't want to put the cart before the host here, horse here, but if we don't host cross country and half marathon in the fall, in all likelihood, they will, go, will not be held at all during 2021 because I just don't think we can move them easily without having too big of an impact on the, uh, the other two sports. Um, Division three women's tennis is a little bit shakier, but I feel pretty confident that the cross country and half marathon will get pulled off uh, in, in our two locations in November. And some people ask me too, why didn't we move some other championships from the spring to the fall? Specifically said, well, why didn't we just move all the golf national championships to the fall? Why didn't we move all the tennis national championships uh, along with cross country? Because those are low impact sports. It was talked about, um, as was beach volleyball. Um, it was talked about. My biggest concerns, having been a coach, to turn to somebody on July 14th and said, hey, I know your season, your practice wasn't supposed to start till January, but guess what? Your practice now starts in August and your first game is the first week of September and you have no schedule and you may not have recruited that way. You may have had a recruit coming in at mid-year or you may not have been done with your recruits or you know, maybe you had some internationals on your roster who knew they weren't gonna be able to get here in the fall and you'd worked it out for them to come uh, either at mid-year or in January and be ready for the season. And now all of a sudden you've changed your whole season. So we just didn't feel that was wise. Plus we thought it was a little bit awkward to tell a bunch of sports, hey, sorry, you can't play in the fall. 
uh, anymore and then actually bring other people into playing. So um, that's kind of a long, again, winded answer to where we got with cross country being and women's D3 tennis being the two sports uh, and half marathon being the sports we think we can run. Bowling is a two semester sport. Bowling will actually start competition this fall. The championship's not till the spring. Golf and tennis actually will have some of their season potentially uh, in the fall if they so choose. Um, there's even a, there are a couple of regions through the country who can qualify, who opt to qualify for the national championship uh, in the fall. Um, so we kind of go with there. So I know that wasn't in our, our packet uh, or our slides, but I know so much has changed over the last couple weeks. Um, we will be updating all of you as things break with each championship because I know that many of you are trying to lock down your schedules for the spring. Uh, and the minute we have championship exact dates and exact locations locked in, we will try to share those with the right folks so that you can continue to build your schedule. So any, I don't see any other questions on there right now. Anything else that anybody can think of? We end now. That'll give you a 10 minute uh, restroom and drink break for those of you that are on the next call. All right. Again, thank you to everybody. And uh, I can tell you, um, I got hired to be the director of championships and sports, and there is nobody that wants to have championships and sports more than I do. And, you know, we really, really feel strongly that the things that went in place yesterday give us our best chance. It's not going to be easy. It is going to be tough on many of you athletic directors and coaches. It stinks for multi-sport athletes. We know that. Um, but it just there really was, when it came down to it, um, this was the best we could do. And, and I know we feel like we're a little bit out on an island right now. Um, but it will, uh, you're going to see a lot of changes, I think, between NCAA and NAIA and stuff coming over the next couple of weeks. And I think you'll see a lot of them doing things very similar to what we have done. Um, Greg, there is on the website a um, host packet. In fact, actually, it's being updated. And I think it needs one more to look through. But if you send me myself an email, uh, rlovett at njci.org, we can send you the um, a bid packet that just explains everything that's needed in general when you when you want to host. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the week with the summer seminar.